Well, if you hadn't noticed, we tend to be a society that uh, has a bit of an obsession with folks who have celebrity status, right? Either as politicians or musicians, authors, actors, athletes, you name it. We have an entire industry that focuses on following these people, right? Getting close to them, getting the best headline or headshot, depending on what part of the uh, industry they work in, and then feeding it to the rest of us. It's because of that industry that we have watched OJ's slow speed chase down the highway, not once, but multiple times over and over. Uh, we, uh, because of that industry, we learned that uh, Bill Clinton really did have relations with that woman um, and that John Edwards was equally as guilty. We now know that over the weekend, 54-year-old Alec Baldwin married his 28-year-old girlfriend in a nice, intimate Manhattan ceremony. And uh, that power pipe singer Adele is now pregnant. Congratulations to Adele. We're all very happy for you. And uh, that Tom Cruise and Katie Holmes, contrary to popular belief, are not going to make it, my friends. We've seen celebrities at their best and at their worst, thanks to the paparazzi and the modern media. Perhaps the true test of who a celebrity really is, though, is in how they deal with interruptions and folks who just want one autograph or one picture with them. And as I mentioned, this can become a bit of an obsession, dangerous even at times. All you have to do is read the interview with the gentleman who, um, who killed John Lennon to realize that is very true. Sometimes we normal folks get too far over the line when it comes to our famous friends. But when someone gets close to a celebrity, we try to get the lowdown, right? We want to know how was it, what happened, what was he or she like. You got to love those little sound bites that come out, um, you know, either in interviews or on Facebook, wherever you might catch them. And that's where we tend to learn a lot about the things that happen between the lines, right? Whether they're true or not where we get an inside glimpse into the lives of the people we want to know about. And believe it or not, that's what makes the scripture readings for today absolutely fascinating to me too, right? There's a lot going on in between the lines of the text that Sally just read to the folks who are openly trying to advocate for themselves in the face of their own celebrity at the time, right? With Jesus standing in front of them, with God in the midst of them. They were uh, people who didn't, wouldn't even necessarily have a voice at the time, some of them, but managed to find their voice in those moments to speak to God. There's more to these scriptures than meets the eye, right? And although the basics are pretty amazing, impressive on their own right, salvation from distress and healing from a seemingly chronic illness and conquering death, it's the who, when, where, what, and how of these stories, the post-interaction interview, right? the background that speaks even lengthier volumes about God, about Jesus, about how he dealt with interruptions in his life, and about who it is that actually matters, right? So the first person we heard from today is the psalmist. And the psalmist was suffering from something we're actually not even sure what it is. We never hear the official verdict on what the problem was. But what we do come to know is that the psalmist is a person of faith, right? Someone who had a relationship with God, someone who was willing to appeal to the mercy and therefore the forgiveness that he had come to know as a part of God's nature. I get the sense if someone had asked the psalmist, what happened to you? That he would have said, I felt alone and awful. I had been in a state of utter distress, but then... Then I remembered my God, the God of Israel, and my hope was rekindled. I was set to praying, asking for mercy and forgiveness, and suggesting to my nation, my beloved brothers and sisters, that they do the same. So no details are really necessary, right? We don't need to know what the problem was. What we do get from the words of the psalm is the sense of a deep-seated belief in God and the idea that God will not allow distress to have the last word. And then when we enter into the narrative in the Gospel of Mark as Jesus crosses back over the Sea of Galilee into familiar territory, we meet up with these three other folks whose own stories scream at us about who God is and how God can change our lives and our hearts. The first of these folks is Jairus, right? Now Jairus is really an interesting character for a lot of different reasons. 
on the surface, with our own context in mind, we just kind of assume that he was a worried and loving father, right? We totally get that because that's how we understand parenting in these days, and that's how we, in the case when any of our children were gravely ill, would deal, right? We would turn to God, we would turn to any of the possible resources that would help in healing. But we have to remember that this was a time before scientific advances, right? One article that I read about the connection between health and faith this past week reminded me that it was generally acceptable for parents to not get too close to their children, right? To not get too attached. Because the infant and child mortality rate was so high that before they knew it, if they got too attached, they would end up with a broken heart. Or in the case of many of them, multiple cracks in that heart of theirs. And, of course, in ancient Israel, girls were not quite as important as boys were. Those who would carry on the blood line, right, especially for powerful people in society. And that's what we get from the story is the case with Jairus, right? He's a powerful guy. He's got a lot riding on this. So just for those reasons, we realize that his case is an interesting one. And to it, the fact that he was, a, add to it, right, the fact that he's a leader in the synagogue. So he's one of the guys who's listening to this crazy preacher guy go around and kind of buck all of the traditions that he's had. He perhaps had even spoken against Jesus. And yet here he is, right, kneeling, begging at the feet of this semi-crazy preacher, teacher, traveling healer guy, right? Now, Jairus, of course, had the power probably to get up close to Jesus. He was a respectable and, and responsible and powerful guy. So he got to push through the huddled masses to get up close. And when he does, that's exactly what he does. He doesn't look at him and say, you know, with some kind of sense of entitlement, you need to do this. He lays down at the feet of Christ and he begs and pleads for the life of his daughter. And so I envision someone saying to Jairus, what happened to you? Like, what were you thinking, right? You don't do that. That's not your position. And I hopefully envision Jairus answering, I couldn't take it anymore, right? I couldn't watch her suffer. I had nowhere else to turn, nothing else to do. I had to humble myself and appeal to the only thing I had left, my hope and faith. And so I turned to him, to Jesus, to the one who challenged my tradition, but whose power I had heard about in action. It was a last resort, but I had to do something. I couldn't let her die without fighting. Jairus initially turned to Jesus, of course, out of a sense of desperation. He had no idea what else to do. And, uh, but then these people come toward him, and they say, your daughter is dead. Why bother this man any longer? And that's when his faith kicks in, right? Perhaps a newfound or a different faith from the one that he espoused in the synagogue with people, but his faith all the same. And in those moments, Jesus preached a very short and challenging sermon. He said, do not fear, only believe. And Jairus listened, and Jairus followed. Which brings us to his daughter, of course, the nameless young woman. After all, at 12 years old, she was about ready to get married and bear children herself in that day and age. And her house surrounding her that day were not only her family, but these professional mourners, right? I mean, that was one of the jobs back in ancient Israel, who were oftentimes called to a site when someone was dying. As one translation puts it, they were the gossips looking for a story and the neighbors bringing casseroles, right? Much like we tend to do. Certainly, we have run into the gossips at times like these or been the folks who work to ply those in need with good food when we're not sure what else it is that we might be able to offer. So whether this girl was truly dead and dying or as some biblical commentators would have it, was just sick enough that she was unconscious or in a coma, she was in need of a miracle. There's no question about that. Because she appeared dead, no one would even have touched her because it would have made them unclean. So perhaps at the time when she needed love and care and someone to hold her hand the most, people retreated and they instead began to mourn. And that was a scene when Jesus arrived, right? Lots of people crying and, and making a scene and he refused to believe that she was dead. And the professionals refused to believe him or believe in him. So they ridiculed him. 
And perhaps because of their ridicule, ridicule, they were left out of the next part of the story, right? The part that makes the difference. Jesus goes into the house, bringing with him only the girl's parents and three of his trusted companions and provokes the girl to rise. Little girl, get up, he says. And when she does, they're overcome with amazement. And wouldn't you be if you were there at that time? So when I envision somebody asking the girl, what happened to you? What were you thinking? I imagine her saying, I was on my way to meet my maker when I heard the voice of someone calling me back, back to my family. And you know what else? When I did that voice, that man continued to care for me. He called on people to feed me and to take care of me, to be sure that I was really returned to health. He showed me the face of compassion. He told me not to tell anyone of what had happened, but how could you not tell of kindness and healing, of compassion and sacrifice? Certainly, I was not the only one who had needs that day to be fulfilled, including himself. And yet he made me a priority at that moment. And when it comes to the final major player, I wonder what people like Jairus had to be thinking, because she was the one who interrupted this whole healing bit in the first place, right? The woman who had been plagued with bleeding for 12 years might possibly have cost his daughter her life in the face of anyone less powerful than God. The woman, instead of fighting for anyone else, was appealing to Jesus for herself. She was coming to him to be healed. She had tried everything. She had worked for years with doctors only to get worse. She had exhausted all of her resources. And at that point, after 12 years of bleeding, she certainly would have been an outcast, right? Ritually unclean and much like the young girl on her deathbed would have made anyone that she touched unclean as well. What a lonely life she must have been living. For both of those reasons, I think the woman tried to get to Jesus in a way that would go unnoticed, right? She was sneaky at worst and deeply faithful at best. She believed that if she could but touch Jesus's clothes, she would be made well. And so she wrestled her way through the crowd for once in the last 12 years, not worrying about who she touched and what the ramifications would be, and she fought for herself. So when I envision someone asking her, what happened to you? I imagine her saying, I couldn't do it anymore. What kind of life was I living? I was as good as dead. No one would even come near me, let alone touch me. I had to do something, and this was my chance. So I pushed my way through the crowd just to touch the edge of his cloak, and you know what? He knew. He knew what had happened. I immediately felt well, and he knew that I had taken something from him. And instead of getting angry or possibly turning around and striking me down, he asked with true curiosity who it was who had touched him. I felt like it was a moment that I was called to step up and answer, and so I did. And do you know what happened? He didn't get angry or try to get mad or send me away or consider himself or me or anyone else unclean because of me. Instead, he looked at me with love and compassion and said, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. And in peace I went. For the first time in 12 years, I was able to find peace. I was able to be near people and to build relationships with people. For the first time in 12 years, people would touch me and I could be me again. Through all that we can read, Right? In between the lines of these stories and the inner monologues of these folks, perhaps, some of which is conjecture, of course, we are reminded of some of the most important foundational characteristics of our God. We are reminded through the words of the psalmist that God is merciful and forgiving, allowing hope and peace, not distress, to have the final word. We learn through the actions of Jairus that humility is sometimes a good thing, period, but especially in the face of our own circumstances and our God, and that God challenges us at times and calms our fears at others. We learn through the story of the young girl that God is compassionate and caring, and we learn through the story of the woman that God wants to know who we are and wants us to be in relationship with God and with one another. When I read these stories, I read into the lives and words and actions of these folks, our ancestors in faith, prayers, right? And haven't we prayed these prayers before? Haven't we appealed to God for forgiveness, for healing, either for ourselves or for someone who's closest to us? 
Haven't we looked to God to provide us with one particular answer to prayer, like the woman, and gotten something else in return? Like a reminder about how important it is to be open and surrounded by other folks who can walk the journey with us. These stories challenge some of our modern day sensibilities, right? After all, we often find ourselves praying for one thing to God, and the answer sometimes comes in the form that we wish, but other times doesn't, which can sometimes be challenging and painful. We live in a society where we do have scientific advances, where we are blessed to have the best when it comes to certain things, including doctors and hospitals here in the United States. We live in a society where we can fix a lot, where we can cure a lot of things. I would argue, as I learned during my hospital chaplaincy internship, though, that there is a difference between being cured and being healed, right? Healing can take place on all sorts of levels, whether cures happen or not. All you have to do is sit at the bedside of someone terminally ill but who is deeply faithful to understand that sometimes God works in people's lives in different ways, bringing them comfort, peace, healing in mind and spirit, and strengthening the love and the faith of those around them. Ideally, we of course get the happy endings that are written about in these stories today. But inevitably, if we are but open and willing, we get reminded about the love and mercy and compassion and peace of our God. We get reminded that we are not alone and that others are here to care about us and support us, whether in person or on the phone or via Facebook, which is my newest mode of pastoral care, friends. <laughs> so I, I envision people asking me someday in the future, what happened to you? Right? I can imagine these two different possible answers. One is, I left God behind in church on Sunday morning. I couldn't possibly believe that my faith mattered when it came to the other parts of my life, like my own health or how I dealt with daily interruptions. The other answer is a little bit different, though. I could say, I brought God out with me into the world. I traveled with God on my journey, and it got me into some challenging situations, but also some life-giving ones. I used my gifts to serve God. I appealed to God for the things I wanted, but opened myself up to the things God knows I needed. I built relationships based on my faith and on the belief that God loves me, forgives me, and offers me more than I can imagine. I tried my hardest to do God's will, not just in church, but outside in my life as well. My hope is that we all, myself included, will be able to answer like that second one, right? That even when the times are tough and we can't quite understand what's happening, that we might hold fast to our faith and do our best to remember that we are not God, but that we have a God who loves us and offers us far than we might ever imagine or deserve. Amen. <laughs>